This is going to be a study about growing soft on sin. Many times when you're around something so much, it just starts to, you just start getting used to it. You grow soft on it. Romans 7, 13 says, Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So the Bible makes sin appear as, as sinful. This world will soften you up to sin. The world makes you think sin's okay. It's got a thousand ways to make you look at a certain sin and not think it's that bad anymore. But Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1, 8-10 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. So all of us are sinners. We sin before we were saved. And if you're honest with God and yourself, then you will admit you've sinned after you've been saved. Romans 3 9 says, For we have proved before for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So you're a sinner, I'm a sinner. That's clear. But there is a difference in a saved, born again believer who still sins but is trying to live right, and a saved born again believer who isn't trying to live right. Jesus walked and talked with sinners. But he says, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So he came to seek and to save that which was lost, but he doesn't support and go along with your sin. But about a year or so ago, recently, a church close to where I live wouldn't let a sodomite sing in their church. And Christians all over town are choosing the world and the sodomite over their brothers and sisters in Christ who are trying to stand up for what's right. They are condemning the church for not letting the sodomite sing while saying, judge not lest you be judged and saying Jesus ate with sinners and saying don't judge someone because they sin differently than you. You know, all the nonsense. But it's sad when Christians will side with the world over other Christians. Just because Romans 3.10 says there is an unrighteous, no, not one, doesn't mean you can just accept a sinful, unrepentant lifestyle from someone and allow them to just do whatever they want, say they can do whatever they want because they're saved. Just because Paul said in Romans 8.38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any of the other creatures shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just because he said that, and it's 100% true, this doesn't mean we should just accept sin in our life or in the life of others. Just because we have eternal security. We fellowship with each other, but when someone has an open, unrepentant lifestyle, it's biblical to keep your distance from that person until they get right with God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, and sodomy is fornication. Jude 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah was full of homosexuals committing fornication. And no Christian has any business hanging out with some person living a sodomite lifestyle. This can be a hard thing for some because it's getting so bad we have homosexuals in our family. We need to pray for them, witness to them, be kind to them. But letting them take part in your everyday life consistently and spending a bunch of downtime with them is wrong and it will affect you in one way or another. You'll begin to grow soft on the sin. And I mean, I have sympathy on people that their, their child turned out to be a homosexual. That can be a horrible thing. That's a horrible, horrible thing. And I mean, I, I don't know how 
to handle that situation 100%, but you can't just grow soft on the sin. You know, there's pe there's been people that have been 100% against homosexuality. Then their child turns out to be that way, and they say, well, maybe it's not so bad. They grew soft on it because someone they loved became a homosexual. But you can't grow soft on sin. And just because their view changed because of someone becoming a homosexual in their life, that, does, that doesn't mean it's right. Just because someone's view changes, it doesn't change the truth. Truth is truth no matter how you view it. When you talk like this, someone automatically was going to jump up and say, well, you just hate people. But no, I don't hate people. I just hate sin, and I don't want to grow soft on sin. Psalms 97.10 says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Proverbs 4, 14 and 15 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it and pass away. So the world is going one way, and the Christian should be walking a completely opposite way. A bunch of pastors who are greedy of filthy lucre want the world to feel comfortable, so they play their sinful music. They accept the world's sinful lifestyle, whether it be adultery or sodomy or lying, cheating, stealing, and only God knows what else. But don't grow soft on the sodomite. Be soft enough to pray for them and witness to them. And remember that, you know, God's going to save anybody. I believe as long as there's breath, there's hope. But remember that sodomites are not sweet. They aren't kind. They are sexual perverts. And every pervert grown man who raped a little boy was a sodomite first. I mean, they had to be a sodomite before they could rape a little boy. They're not sweet. They're perverted. You see, a lot of y'all, you go to Walmart, or you go to CVS, or Walgreens, or Food City, and you'll get a little gay cashier, and he's real nice to you, and you think, uh, huh, well, these homosexuals aren't so bad, they're actually sweet. No, you don't know what you're talking about. That is a sexual pervert. These transgenders are perverts, and they want they want in the bathroom. They want to use the same bathroom. I got a problem with a grown man that wants to use the same bathroom as my little daughter uses. That's weird, and he's a pervert. Sexual sins like this lead to other more bizarre and deranged sexual sins. For example, in Leviticus 18, 22, and 23, it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind, as with womankind it is an abomination. How can you not believe that? Uh, how, can you, how can you say that homosexuality is all right and that the Bible is not against it when you just read that? It says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind, as with womankind. That's as much in the Bible as John three sixteen. That's as much as in the Bible as, as anything yet you're rejecting it because you love your sin so much. It says, Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith, neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there to. It is confusion. So you have homosexuality right next to bestiality. You start out looking at porn. Then you start committing the physical act. Then these men end up going after other men, then they begin to get into more deranged sexual sins because 
Sin starts out small and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The reasons people accept sin so much today is because they have pleasure in them that do them. They're watching the dirty movies. They're listening to the filthy music. They're listening to these horribly wicked rappers and singers. They have all kinds of evil communication all around them. The more you see sin, the less you think it's sinful. TikTok is full of the devil. There is filth all over it. And you sit and look at that all day long. You're going to get pretty soft on sin. You're going to get pretty soft on seeing a woman dressed up like a whore and dancing like a whore to millions of people. It's not just sodomy that's wrong. Adultery is wrong. Uh, even adultery that's just in your heart. Jesus says if you look on a woman lust after you committed adultery with her already in your heart. Your marriage is bad because you're so busy looking at everyone else's wife beside your own wife. You're so, you hate your husband so much because you're too busy looking at all these other men in Hollywood and things like that. And you got uh, all these unrealistic standards. A lot of married men and women get these celebrity crushes. And they got p posters and pictures of these half-naked celebrities on their wall and on uh, their Facebook wall. And if you go to their Facebook and look at the pictures, you see pictures of uh, celebrity men with their shirts off. That's wicked. The Lord said if you look on a woman to lust after her, then you have committed adultery with her already in your heart. And he used the example of a man looking at a woman because, you know, when a woman starts lusting after men looking at them, all the time it's getting pretty bad. It's wicked for a man to put his woman crush Wednesday on social media when he has a wife. It's wicked for the woman to have a man crush Monday when she has a husband. Just because you, uh, somebody's a celebrity doesn't mean you can lust after that person. It's like, what I don't understand is it's like, you know, they got somebody at work uh, that they that's attractive and they think, well, I can't, I can't lust after them, but I can lust after these celebrities. I mean, I don't understand what these people are thinking but you're not supposed to look at other people like you do your husband and wife. In Joshua 7, 21, Achan saw something he wanted, then he coveted it, then he took it. Before David took Bathsheba, he saw her, then he lusted, and then he took her. Starts in your mind. The reason you're so unsatisfied with your mate is because you're looking at everybody else's mate. You see, where these women they'll they'll start they go crazy about these celebrities with their shirts off, and all these uh, all their other girlfriends with them going crazy about it. I'm thinking, aren't you married? You're making a fool of yourself. The reason you're so unsatisfied with your mate is because you're looking at everybody else's. Proverbs twenty seven twenty says, "Hell and destruction are never full." So the eyes of man are never satisfied. So the reason you can sin so much in your mind is because you have images in your mind that keep giving you sinful thoughts. Each wicked image you put in your mind makes it easier to sin in the mind. You can't help it, but so much in uh, the times we're living in, you see women dressing wickedly. You see men dressing wickedly. Uh, it's... And then you people, men go look at porn. They get their image, their mind full of these images. The more porn you look at, the more bizarre your fetish will become. You can hear testimony after testimony of men who have looked at pornography. They ended up looking at more and more bizarre, strange pornography to get that fixed, to get that um, excitement in them satisfied. Sin takes you farther than you want to go. You think you're in control, but then it's in control after a while. Romans 8.13 says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You don't want to live after the flesh. 
You're just going to die before your time. But these video games people playing today, those are wicked. Talk about something that will make you grow soft on sin. On these games, you can act out every sin you ever thought of and not even have to face the real-life consequences of killing and stealing and fornicating. You go home and you simulate murder on these video games. You get your NBA 2K, create a player mode, and escape into some fantasy world where you're an NBA superstar because you're not content with your own life. The idea of video games where you get rewards and achievements is flat out worldly. I'm not saying that it's all bad or that you can't play a little bit of video games or something every now and then. But it turns into an idol for a lot of people. And when you're more worried about getting rewards and achievements on a game than you are getting rewards in heaven, you got an idol on your hands. You don't want to go against Matthew 6, 19 and 20 that says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth, moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Colossians 3, 2, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You got men that will come home from work, if they aren't too lazy to work to begin with, I and mean, would rather play a game, a video game than to show love to their wife. That's weird. If you would play a game so much that you defraud your wife in the bedroom, then you're going in a really strange, bad direction. If you would rather play with the boys on a video game than to go to the bedroom with your wife, that's weird. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 4, and 5 says, The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not the, not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to prayer and fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Then a lot of men... They can't stand being around their wife because of her big mouth. I know women personally, and I have certain ones in mind when I say this, but they talk so bad to their husbands that everyone in the room is embarrassed for her. I am embarrassed for her. When she opens her mouth and talks to her husband the way she does, it's flat out embarrassing and sick and disgusting. And I do have people in mind when I say this. The Lord isn't sexist, but he makes it clear that a woman will have a problem with her big mouth. But I hear women telling their husbands to move out of the way, to shut up, and constantly telling him what to do. And, I mean, this she thinks that she's all that or something, or she's some big queen in the home sitting on a throne. And they think... That their husband is there to just make their life like a Nicholas Sparks movie or something. But the Bible makes it clear in Genesis 2.18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. The man isn't your helpmeet. You're his helpmeet. But Christians have grown soft on sin. The man now has to worship the woman. You see through the Bible this goddess worship. If you read history, you'll see the goddess worship. You see these mo Hollywood movies. The man is always having to win the woman over. And Christians have grown soft on that sin. I mean, I'm not just picking on women. The men are just straight up deadbeats. I mean, they don't want to do nothing. The average man, he just wants to come home and play a video game like a child. He has no interest in the Bible. He couldn't lead the home if his life depended on it. He doesn't want to be the spiritual leader. He's too much of a lazy sissy to open the Bible and, and lead his family right. So, I mean, you can't blame the women half the time for having to get up and scream her big mouth off. But, I mean... If both people will do their part, if the man be what he ought to be, if the woman be what she ought to be, it's going to be a very happy marriage. 
what the Bible says in 1 Peter 1 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's your way of life. In all your way of life, you want to be holy. You don't want people to find any uncleanness in how you're living. 1 Peter 1 16, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Timothy 2 9 and 10. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. 1 Timothy 4 7. But refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So over and over again, you see the Lord talking about godliness, holiness, maintaining good works, not yielding your members as instruments of unrighteousness. You're saved by grace through faith without works, but it's clear through the whole Bible, through the Pauline epistles, that you need to live holy and godly in this present evil world. And that's what's pleasing to God. But this has just been a quick study on not growing soft on sin.